Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Hey, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Carr and I am the Chief Knowledge Broker for OCTO, um, which stands for Open Communications for the Ocean. And we're very pleased to welcome you here today to, um, to the webinar. Um, we're very, very pleased to have our speakers here today, uh, Johnny Briggs and Felipe Paredes of the IUCN OECM Specialist Group. Um, they're going to be speaking today about a new tool for identifying other effective area-based conservation measures, OECMs. Um, and we're when during the webinar, the webinar will be an hour long, and um, I wanted to let everyone know we welcome questions. We'll have the the presentation first. We welcome questions. You can send them in at any time during the presentation, but uh, the only questions will will we'd address during the presentation would be any quick clarifying questions like acronyms or something. We'll hold the substantive questions for the end after the presentation. Um, and you can send questions in two ways. Uh, it's a little easier for, for us to handle and moderate questions sent in through the question panel, but you can also send in uh, questions and comments um, in the chat. You're welcome to send in relevant comments to the webinar, any, including any other resources people should know about that are relevant to the topic in the chat. Um, and because you can make them visible to everyone on the in the webinar. Um, but we just ask that you keep it professional and on the topic. Um, and But we'll be mostly monitoring the questions, but I'll also be checking the chat for any for additional questions that come in that way. So um, thank you all for being here, and a special thanks to, to Johnny and Felipe for um, being able to make themselves available to present today, and I'll turn it over to you guys. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for having us. Felipe, do you want to introduce yourself first, and then I'll come in with the owning slides. Yeah, thank you, uh, and hello, everybody. I'm Felipe Paredes. I'm based in Santiago, Chile, and I'm the vice chair for the marine theme at the World Commission of Protected Areas at, uh, of IUCN. <clears throat> Cheers. So I am um, Johnny Briggs. I'm speaking to you today from Paddington in London. Um, I work on a, on a daily basis for the, the Pew Charitable Trust, but today, uh, Felipe and myself are representing IUCN WCPA. We, we have the honor of uh, co-chairing the Marine uh, Working Group on OECMs, which, which the IUCN has formed. And what they're basically doing at the IUCN is engaging in various regions and habitats and looking at basically offering guidance on OECM identification, management, and trying to seek consistency in the application of the criteria that we're gonna talk about today. So this is a broader effort of the IUCN. Um, you know, I don't know how much you guys know about uh, other effective conservation measures, but they're undoubtedly proving complex and at times confusing. And as such, the IUCN has developed a new tool for identifying them. And that's what Felipe is going to come in and speak about a bit later in this talk. But I wanted to offer first some, some context, really, about other effective conservation measures, where they originated, um, what's happening with them at the moment, uh, some gray areas. So I'm going to provide the kind of policy context to start with. Then Felipe is going to come in and speak about the tool. Then I'm going to come in at the end and just sort of address a few areas of subjectivity which have come up and, and arisen in terms of OECMs in a marine context. Um, so if I just flick on a slide, oh, can I do that? Excuse me, this is where it all goes wrong, isn't it? Oh. Well, no, sometimes if it's it's there for a while, it sort of gets stuck. Um, so you can back <laughs> out of the presentation and then put it back in presentation mode. Okay. 
Oh, right. oh there we go. Um, so as I said, I'm going to speak about the global biodiversity framework within which other effective conservation measures sit in the target, explicitly about OECMs. Felipe is going to come in on the tool, and I'm going to talk about a couple of other things beyond that. So if we look at the uh, GBF, now, other effective conservation measures are a key component of a crucial target within the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. So it's really important to consider what is the intent of the GBF, of this big agreement, which was agreed in 2012. So then, then we can understand the context in which OACM sits. As a lot of you know, the GBF was agreed in 2022. And although we hear that the 30 by 30 target you know, is key, we hear about that so much, it seems to have prevalence, but that's actually um, one of you know, four goals and 23 targets that sit within the framework. Now, if we look at the mission of the framework, what it sets out to deliver, you know, what is the um, uh, terrestrial and, and oceanic ecosystem that we hope to see by 2050, it details quite a few things that it's setting out to do, you know, to halt and reverse biodiversity loss. It also includes you know, sustainable use of biodiversity and ensuring that all this is underpinned by the equitable sharing of benefits. So, you know, there are numerous targets, as I said, but really crucial, um, I think, to the conservation of the ocean are targets three, five, and 10. And as we said, you know, target three is the target within which other effective conservation measures sit, and you can see it here. And, you know, I think that if you think about that language before about the mission of the GBF, I think that the you know, the key role of target three is to conserve and protect the ocean uh, to the extent that the outcomes of those policy interventions are to equitably halt and reverse biodiversity loss and put it on the path to recovery. Whereas targets five and 10 are of equal importance because these are, you know, really the other 70% of the ocean are really focused on uh, ensuring that commercial activities are sustainably managed and don't offset that recovery of biodiversity that we're talking about for target three. Now, undoubtedly, you know, policymakers, target three here is the only quantitative target. So there's kind of a dash to place area-based measures into target three by policymakers to get the credit and to kind of ignore a little bit targets five and 10. And just as a sort of a visualization of that, this kind of shows um, what we're talking about there. You know, target three, 30%, protected areas and OECMs. Uh, really, the sustainable use part of this uh, pie chart is, you know, targets five and 10. But as per the language on the previous slide on target three, you know, in sh sustainable use is allowed uh, within target three, but it's got to be uh, fully consistent with conservation outcomes, what you're trying to do. And this will all be relevant uh, in due course when we talk about other effective conservation measures. So what are OECMs? Now, the key point here is that although OECMs first appeared in IHC Target 11 in 2010, confusion really reigned on what exactly they are and how they might be applied to global conservation efforts. Now, with that in mind, a key date was 2018, when the CBD agreed COP decision 14A. And, you know, that decision, which is in effect a 19-page document agreed by the parties, was the first to define OECMs. And the definition is written down here. It also details that they should be comparable, comparable in conservation outcomes to MPAs, that they should enhance connectivity. Uh, and also, um, you know, so a key point here is that, you know, protected areas, they're about intent. So if you're thinking about protected area, you are restricting activities within a certain area and the intent is to, um, you know, uh, garner biodiversity outcomes. Whereas for OECMs, you're really looking at the outcomes. You're trying to measure uh, in, in some sort of way the specific outcome of something that you're doing. And if we, if we look at this definition, which might be a bit confusing, I think that we can consider OECMs in two different categories. The first is that you know, areas that are not designed primarily to protect biodiversity, you know, that's the goal of MPAs but they still deliver effective and enduring conservation outcomes. So for example, if you have a war grave in the ocean, that might be placed off limits 
you know, uh, to all human activity, our respect for the dead, but that lack of disturbance would actually create significant biodiversity benefits and could therefore potentially count as an OECM. The second kind of category of OECMs, I would say, is that those that actually do list biodiversity as a primary objective, like MPAs, but they're not officially classified as protected areas for governance reasons. So this might happen, for example, where indigenous peoples or local communities have decided to conserve an area using traditional practices without formal recognition by the regional or national government. I think that if you think about this COP decision as well that was published, and this is from, from which all other OECM guidance um, proliferates, there are a few key pillars to the language in those 19 pages. The first is that OECMs are supposed to encourage inclusive participation. The second is that encourage mainstreaming into sectors. So the language says that OECM should be pushed into key sectors such as agriculture, fisheries, energy. So it's basically trying to encourage uh, conservation outcomes uh, from these different sectors to be kind of um, enhanced and to be recognized within target three. The third is guidance. So what this COP decision said is it encouraged the likes of the IUCN and the FAO to produce its own expert guidance to basically support the identification of other effective conservation measures. The fourth thing it did was to say there are four different criteria which need to be applied to OECMs. So I'll let you just stare at this for a second and see if you can guess which of the four um, which apply to other effective conservation measures. And Felipe is gonna get into this a bit later. It's better with active participation, but you know these are the four. So fundamentally, an OECM is not currently recognized as a protected area. It achieves sustained and effective contribution to the in situ conservation of biodiversity. It's governed and managed, and it brings associated ecosystem functions and services and cultural, spiritual, socioeconomic, and other locally relevant values. And as I said, everything cascades down from the CBD COP decision. So we've already got FAO guidance on fisheries OECMs. You've got national guidance on identifying OECMs, for example, from Canada. Regional bodies such as HELCOM in the Baltic are, are developing excellent uh, means for their members to identify their effective conservation measures. And I, as I said, IUCN has their guidance, which they're developing at the moment, kind of redrafting uh, as new kind of thoughts are, are coming online. Felipe is going to be talking about the latest publication on the right there, this site identification tool. So, as I said, they first appeared in IHE Target in 20, uh, uh, 2010. But if you look at the World Database of Protected Areas at the moment, and World Day, you know, combining that with the World Database of OECMs, there's 8.2%. Uh, I can't actually see the, I think it's 8.28% of the ocean is um, is protected at the moment within marine protected areas and OECMs. Uh, but 8.16 of that is an MPA. So about 99% is MPAs, which shows just how few OECMs are in the database. And what they actually look like on a map here is, and this was from a publication by uh, Claude Aetal in 2022, but I believe that only two marine OECMs have been added since this point, Colombian sites, but we've got you know, Canadian other effective conservation measures. So most are close to bottom contact fisheries uh, in, this, in this instance. You've got a few Colombian examples and a couple more, as I said, have been added. There are a few from the UK in Guernsey, there's some in Morocco, South Africa, and the Philippines. But what this shows, if you read it, is that at the point this was published, there's, you know, some of these submissions were terrestrial areas. Some really shouldn't necessarily um, comply with OECM criteria. So it showed a bit of a lack of understanding. And what we're seeing at the moment is this real um, increase of interest in other effective conservation measures. You know, the US as part of a, a means of deciding what might qualify under America the Beautiful Act is looking at its fisheries under, under the Magnuson-Stevens Act and thinking which might qualify. There's a whole process in, in HELCOM looking at OECMs. In NIAF, the Northeast Atlantic Fisheries Commission, there's some case studies. Argentina is exploring other effective conservation measures. So is Mexico, the Caribbean, all over the place. I think the FAO is having a um, workshop soon with regional fisheries bodies to support them to identify uh, other effective conservation measures. So 
even though the proportion is so low at the moment of the total in the world database, it seems, you know, you can be pretty sure that as we move towards 30 by 30, there's going to be, you know, a high proportion of other effective conservation measures included or counted in that effort. So that then begs the question whether, you know, if progress towards 30 by 30 will be via OECMs, is that a risk to conservation or an opportunity? If we think that target three, we thought was to basically reverse decline of biodiversity and encourage it uh, to replenish, are OECMs a good thing in that sense? And there've been quite a few um, publications on this. And here's just a few here, but really there's this kind of two sides to the argument, you know, are they a fantastic thing that they are more equitable and they equitably bridge the conservation fisheries divide? You know, mainstreaming conservation activities into sectors such as fisheries and counting those towards 30 by 30? Or is there this, you know, inherent risk with other effective conservation measures? It negates the need for policymakers to, for example, designate fully protected areas and instead existing measures such as certain fisheries measures could be relabeled as OECMs with little additionality uh, to biodiversity, kind of undermining global conservation efforts. And I think there's a kind of mixed feeling at the moment, depending on you talk to on whether, you know, the positives outweigh the negatives. But I think to an extent, this is why we're here today and why I'm going to hand over to Felipe to talk about the IUCN's site identification tool, because it really helps, um, you know, users and, and, you know, people governing bodies, managers, to run potential sites through the tool and try to decide whether they do comply with the criteria and whether they should potentially therefore count towards 30 by 30. So Felipe, I'll hand over to you and you just let me know when you want me to change each slide. Thank you, Johnny. Yes, so what I'm presenting here is uh, the recently published uh, uh, site uh, level tool to identify um, OECMs. Uh, I have to say that this is a um, ge generic tool that applies to both terrestrial and marine ecosystems and uh, also to, uh, to freshwater ecosystems. And the, 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 the idea of publishing this uh, tool was to support decision makers with, with clear guidance uh, and contribute to the standardization of the identification of OECMs. Um, I have to say that for the identification of OECMs, uh, it had to be on a site basis. Not all uh, area-based management tools uh, can be uh, recognized, identified and recognized as OECM. It had to be run to each of the sites uh, that are being um, evaluated uh, as uh, OECMs. Uh, I, the 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 tool is now available online. There's a link down there that you can access. I think somebody's asking where you can get this tool, and is uh, for the moment is is uh, publishing in English. But hopefully, uh, during the next month, we can have uh, this tool translated into other languages. Can have the next one, please. So some key ideas. Uh, on the tool. Uh, so this tool is basically a generic and broad uh, guidance for um, uh, evaluating OECMs at the site level. Uh, so there's room for judgment, you know, so more accurate and legit legitimate judgment are likely to come from involvement of the relevant expert and consultation with stakeholders. So there's room for judgment. Uh, this is a, a, a framework, I would say, in terms of the, as a tool, it's a framework to uh, provide some basic principles and questions. This uh, OECM identification is voluntary and consent-based. This is something new. Uh, we know that the same, the same for MPAs, you know, consent is also very important. It's part of the, the good governance of, of protected areas. Um, th this does not affect or require the changes on ownership or rights. So all previously assigned rights and ownership are uh, should be respected and, and considered and not changed. 
And also there's a very clear respect of, for indigenous and local rights, including uh, free uh, prior and informed consent, which is central uh, to running this uh, evaluation tool before uh, having a full assessment. I, I'll show that in a moment. And also the governing uh, authority is also very important um, to the process. So we had to be clear who's in charge, who is going to, the, the governing authority, uh, considering both formal and informal rights. Can I have the next one, please? So the, 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 the general overview of the tool includes six steps uh, with eight criteria. Johnny mentioned these eight criteria that, you know, there are four of them are central, but this is a very, you know, step-by-step -step, uh, process. The, the first step is the screening uh, process of uh, the proposed OECMs with uh, the first two uh, criteria, you know, this is an, a PA or not, or is likely to have uh, biodiversity outcomes. Then after that first screen, we have step two, which is the, cons the consent part or for before the full assessment uh, of the, the site. Um, and this include governing authorities, indigenous people and local communities and others. It could be others. Uh, and this is, a, of course, a case by case um, uh, analysis. And then after you have the concern, the consent, the you can run the full assessment with the other six uh, criteria. And the output here is a uh, confirmed OECMs for the first step, step is a potential OECM running the first two criteria. And then after the consent, you can have the, um, the final and, and full assessment. Can I have the next one, please? Thank you. So the, the general, uh, structure the content of the guide the tool uh, is divided in in different tables it's very user friendly uh, and it's divided in um, this table include the, the criterion that we're trying to answer for each of the sites and then there are questions that you have to answer uh, and then the answer had to be kind of simple this is a yes or no or uncertain or partially. So there are three options for each of the questions. And then you have to, there's space to, for writing down what is the, ju the justification uh, of your response. And then there's a general guideline on uh, the guidance for each of the criteria. So all the different steps and all eight criteria are structured in this um, kind of question response and guidance format. Can I have the next one, please? So the, for the first step, screening, here the, the main objective of this step is to avoid with the waste of time and resources by assessing two of the most important criteria and excluding the site that are clearly not OECMs. And here, the first two criteria is one, is a PA or in this case, an MPA or not? So that's the first criteria. And then the second one, is there reasonable likelihood? There's a reasonable information that these sites have important biodiversity values. So th those are the first two uh, main points for this first step. We know that out there, there are places in the ocean that we do have some uh, information that could be or can have important biodiversity values. Can have the next one, please. Then criteria two, I think is, is uh, very important because this is what actually connects in terms of the, uh, the uh, biodiversity values with MPAs. And here's eight, six different um, values, definition of values. Uh, rare, threatened, or endangered species and ecosystems, natural ecosystems that are underrepresented in protected area networks so they can complement the efforts uh, in terms of protected areas, 
um, high level of ecological integrity or intactness, uh, significant population or extent of an uh, endemic or range restricted species or ecosystems, uh, important species aggregations such, such as uh, spawning, breeding, or feeding areas. And finally, the importance for ecological connectivity as part of our network of sites in a larger area. Remember that also target three of the global biodiversity framework uh, recommend to um, promote both OECMs and MPA that are integrated into a larger seascape. So um, this um, um, biodiversity value F is in that um, 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 idea of uh, the connectivity of different uh, sites. And then um, the, 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 the tool, the idea is to identify at least one of these uh, biodiversity values to be recognized, identified and, rec and recognized as OECMs. But of course, there's a broad range of values that had to be accommodated. And this is, again, a, a local decision on criteria uh, needed. And, and, and um, of course, this uh, step, uh, it might be uh, very uh, data and evidence in, in, in intensive, uh, but we'll see that that's, you have to provide the proof of that in the next full assessment. Can I have the next one, please? Yeah. So the second step is the consent. So you're running the first step that is, you know, the first two criteria is an MPA or not, or if you have a, a reasonable likelihood that, you know, there's some biodiversity value. And if you have just for, for both, you can run the consent. And of course here, the, por the purpose is to ensure that the necessary permission is given um, by you know stakeholders and rights holders, and also to encourage the involvement, the participation of uh, relevant uh, stakeholders. Um, key points here: a judgment required in the selection of stakeholders. It's very important that people that is running this tool know uh, very well the site, know who are the right holders and stakeholders of each of the sites. Um, of course, there's a adaptation of the tool to different conditions, different sites. And but here the most important part is that they they meet the minimum standard of the CDB and um, of um, the the OCM. Can have the next one. So after you have the consent, you have to run step three, which is the full assessment. And, and here the purpose is to uh, determine if a site uh, meets the CDB uh, criteria to be recognized uh, as OECMs. And here uh, we have to run the other six uh, criteria from criteria three to eight. And here, you know, you will need uh, to uh, maybe form like a group of people, experts, or people that knows the place very well from local communities and, and, and stakeholders to run this process. Can I have the next one, please? And then there's guidance for, I think for uh, uh, evaluating each of the different criteria. For criterion three, uh, the site is geographically defined. And the question is, does the site have clear boundaries? And you know the guidance include this is not necessarily had to be marked in the, in the field, but if, if it is map or agree, it's a geographically uh, known and defined, uh, is, is, is um, um, enough for this uh, criteria. Um, as we know for MPAs, the, you know, when we identify geographically an MPA, uh, normally how, how we see them is uh, a polygon, a figure, and that are drawn on the surface of the water. But here we know that you know, the, the three dimension, dimension of the, the ocean uh, is includes that the projection of the, the, the boundaries uh, from the, 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 the surface of the ocean to the seafloor. So it's important here to avoid vertical zoning. We have to, we know 
from the scientific point of view that both the water column and the seafloor are connecting are co connected they're um, you know exchange it to energy and, and material so ideally um, we have to uh, consider the integrality uh, and avoid any vertical zoning uh, of the uh, criteria three uh, the size is also important they have to be uh, big enough but not you know, big enough to cover a, a big proportion of an ecosystem or the, uh, the, the, the distribution of a species, but not too big um, in terms of uh, the management, you know, the, all the complexity of management, big uh, sites. And then again, they had to be ideally in a mosaic and, and complement other uh, possible uh, sites, both MPAs and other ABMTs. Can I have the next one, please? Then for criterion four, uh, the site is confirmed to support biodiversity values. Remember in, in the first step, we were talking about, uh, we have, there's a reasonable likelihood that this, you know, they're meeting this, this uh, eight uh, biodiversity value. In this case, we have to confirm that these values are there. So uh, this, step is very, um, I would say, evidence or data intensive. We, we need to uh, provide enough both scientific and also local and, and traditional knowledge, you know, from indigenous people and, and local communities. Uh, in the case of re restoration effort, this is, um, is okay. But we need to uh, have the, the demonstration that this restoration is also um, uh, providing biodiversity values. And, and, and this is different. When we talk about biodiversity values, it's not the same as uh, ecosystem services necessarily. Uh, so ecosystem services and, and other uh, cultural and spiritual or recognitional values do not define and OCM. This is very important. Um, the management of, of uh, for example, uh, some resources, marine resources, is not enough to uh, identify this an, as an OCM. We need uh, biodiversity value and data to to uh, to report them. The next one, please. Criteria five: institutions or mechanisms exist to govern and manage the, the site. This is again very. Uh, uh, Case by case, and country, country, you know, different countries have different mechanisms of management and governance for different sites. So, here's the, uh, uh, you know, the local perspective to the tool, uh, you know, government, private, or IPLC groups, or any combination of these. We have, we have to identify this. Passive management is fine. I think in many cases, passive management is part of the. Um, the 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 con you know is what is um, at the end of the day what is um, providing this uh, biodiversity values but it not necessarily had to be an active management to have conservation values it could be also passive management and we if we don't if we don't identify the governance and the management uh, uh, mechanism here this is not an OCM so this is very important can I have the next one please. Then criterion six, governance and management of the site achieved or, or are expected to achieve. So it's something that could be potential uh, to achieve in situ conservation of important biodiversity value. Uh, this is, um, it could be difficult, uh, could be potentially difficult criterion to apply, uh, requires discussion because it's connecting in a way the governance and the management of a site with the uh, final uh, biodiversity value. So is something is there any relationship between both? And of course, it, this requires a discussion uh, and its focus is more on the impact of the management uh, in terms of the, the, the biodiversity uh, outcomes and, and also focus on how pressure and threats are mitigated. Is this governance and management of the site is providing is connecting to the biodiversity values or not. And of course, this expected is not a curve pressure. So people have to be very, um, um, they have to know very well their sites 
so they can also identify not only current threats or pressures, but also uh, future or post or potential uh, pressures uh, of the sites. Can I have the next one, please. So some some example of uh, a, a criteria C that likely could be an OCM permanent set aside uh, areas, for example, permanent fishing closures could be a uh, marine OCMs, restoration or introduction of, that have shown results, a site where we don't have all the data, but modeling and experience support a positive outcome. And, and finally, uh, management measures that have both negative and positive impact, but then at the end of the day, you know, the net impact is positive. And then on the other hand, can I have the next one, please, John? On the other hand, uh, what is not likely to be an OECM, a conflict and insecurity that make management unfeasible. So management and governance had to be very clear and strong. Pressures are not controlled by management. So it's impossible to manage uh, external, generally uh, this pressure uh, or site that have industrial state scale activities. For example, in the case of, of, of uh, the ocean, industrial fisher fisheries should not uh, maybe be counted at OCM and the management is for conservation of a single species or group. Here, the idea is to, again, conserve the integrality of the ecosystem and not a single species of a group of species. Next one, please. Criterion three, in situ conservation of important biodiversity values is expected to be for the long term. So again, here's uh, again, uh, important to consider this long-term concept. How long, you know, how long, how many years uh, had to be considered long-term. So, you know, this prediction of the future also is very subjective. And, you know, uh, we need to have, uh, you know, examples of reasonable likelihood, for example, any legal or, or, or formal arrangement, for example, uh, to manage a species or something like that. Uh, and then unlikely to be an OCM, site that have under severe threat because it's very unlikely that uh, they can you know conserve you know biodiversity values in the long term if they're under severe threat threats. The next one please. And finally criterion eight governance and management arrangement address equity issues. This is also very important. It's part of the good governance of um, both MPAs and OCMs. Uh, and this is no universal standard. Is key is, is um, you know important to uh, consider the aspect of equity, recognition, procedure, and distribution where applicable, and re refers to stakeholders and right holders identified for consent. Next one, please. And then at the end of the you know running this this uh, uh, site level two, these three steps, uh, if all uh, answers to the different tables are yes, you know, answer it for the different criteria. This qualifies as an OECM subject to consent. If you have some partial or unknown, this is not currently an OECM, but, you know, maybe after gathering more data or improving the capacities or, or the management, we can maybe reassess uh, and then um, analyze if these sites are can be identified as OCNs. And, I, and at the end, if you have many no's in the answer, this is not an OCM and possibly, possibly you can um, reassess if the situation changes. Thank you, Johnny. Back to you. Thank you. Um, so I was going to say, I don't want to eat too much more time with these slides so we don't eat into the questions, but maybe I do want to do that because it's complicated. Um, but the, you know, as Felipe said, the, the, um, the tool which you just described does a great job, uh, uh, you know, supporting OECM identification and it offers uh, guidance on how to work your way through it. But through that process and through, you know, the last few years, I think you know, the, the IUCN and others have recognized, and as Felipe said at the start, you know, some, you know, it's not judgment-free evaluating whether a site might be another effective conservation measure. And this is because, you know, primarily within that CBD COP decision I mentioned, there's clear areas of kind of ambiguity or subjectivity 
and how one lands on uh, interpreting those could really determine whether a site, when you run it through this process, might qualify as an OECM according to the user or not qualify. And you know, due to that, the you know the IUCN is as part of the process of um, developing a second draft of its OECM guidance is looking at areas of ambiguity within a marine context and kind of trying to produce guidance on what, you know, how these, you know, gray areas might be interpreted. I'm just gonna look at a couple of them today and these are not set in stone. These are being developed at the moment, but this is the current thinking. You know, the, this point about whether, you know, OECMs, there was a feeling that OECMs, they're already kind of all in existence. Uh, so you're, you're recognizing a measure which has been in the ocean already for 10 years. But actually there's an argument, and I think this is where it lands now, that they can also be created. You know, the, the original concept of an OECM is that they would recognize existing management, but it's now increasingly predicted that they, are, they can be established in marine ecosystems through the development of new management measures. So these, these new created OECMs, um, you know, from intentionally developing some sort of management system, you know, for that you have to use best available science to really assume the long-term, the long-term effective conservation benefits. You know, in both those cases, the OECM must meet the criteria, obviously. And if at some stage it determined that it doesn't deliver long-term benefits, the area should either be improved or removed from the um, from the database. You know, the second thing is is this idea that in the ocean context, if we're lacking data. Um, you know, what, what do we do about that? We're, we're supposed to identify important biodiversity values in an area. Well, what is the standard of proof? And, you know, the, the argument here that the IUCN is developing is that, you know, many sites already have identified, uh, you know, and there's available global data sets on what is there. And it can be complemented by the data sets, such as IUCN species maps, fisheries information, info from universities, traditional knowledge can also be incorporated and expert groups can be assembled to sort of define important areas. Again, you've got to act on the best information available to define uh, OECMs. And, you know, the standard of proof in international law is that the claim must be proven on the balance of probabilities or the preponderance of evidence. So in simple terms, this means that it is likely to be true. Now, as Felipe touched upon, you know, what is effective conservation? Well, again, according to the way IUCN is developing its thinking on this, you know, all threats or pressures in an area should be known. Um, you know, all threats or pressures that can be addressed by place-based management are being mitigated. So for example, you know, um, flow from a river on land cannot be managed through a marine OECM. So that is not a manageable pressure. Impacts of climate change are not manageable. Um, you know, and this, you've got to show that the result is the maintenance or enhancement of biodiversity. And again, the, the, the sort of conservation benefits are supposed to be equivalent to MPAs, notwithstanding, obviously, that some MPAs are a bit, are a bit crap. Um, so this comes up a lot as well. You know, there's been guidance developed by the FAO on fisheries. That's kind of, um, you know, the, the leading kind of sector thinking about marine OECMs. But, you know, offshore wind farms, for example, comes up quite a lot. If you, if you create something, you know, if you have an offshore wind farm, then you might basically ban fishing around that area. And that could bring these kind of ancillary bio, biodiversity benefits. And, you know, where the IUCN is landed on this, there's nothing uh, precluding these sites from qualifying. But again, you've got to run it through the criteria, um, you know, as a, as a key, you know, you always got to go back to that, always go back to the criteria. Um, so again, can fishing be permitted in other effective conservation measures? Well, yeah, of course it can. And you know, we've got guidance on this now. You know, the, the way the IUCN is thinking on this, you know, marine areas managed for large scale sustainable fishing, as we said, should be reported under target 10 of the global uh, biodiversity framework. Um, areas in which unsustainable fishing is occurring cannot qualify as OECMs or target 10. You know, if fishing or other extractive activities are at a lower level, and compatible with the ecological values of the OECM, then yeah, that could be recognized as, a, as another effective conservation measure. So we've got to consider it on a case-by-case -case basis. Again, as Felipe touched upon, can single species uh, protections be counted? And again, this is about if you've mitigated all threats to the, um, 
to the ecosystem that you're supposedly, you know, bringing conservation benefits to through your OECM. So if it's a single species measure, for example, you know, a requirement not to harass whales or use turtle excluders is happening in an area, but in that same area, you've got trawling or something highly damaging, then obviously it shouldn't count. So single species measures can count, but you've got to consider other threats to the area that you're seeking to protect. And again, the classic that we touched upon is vertical zoning. And the IUCN certainly uh, advises against vertical zoning where possible within marine protected areas and OECMs due to this perceived cascading effect. If you have a benthic closure, but a, a sort of damaging commercial fishery in the water column above, then you'd think that the ecosystem is connected and that would impact the OECM. But again, you've got to make a judgment on how damaging that activity is as to whether vertical zoning um, should be acceptable. And, and a lot of the OECMs in the world database and being considered are vertically zoned. We've got to, we've got to come on that. And just finally looking at the time, quarter six here, um, you know, IUCN is developing, I think, a series of case studies, which will go into the um, guidance. Here's just a few here that, that I won't read out that are kind of already included and are being considered. Um, so there's a kind of variety of potential marine OECMs uh, in the offing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an exciting time where, you know, a lot of these are now being considered, uh, being developed and potentially brought online. So I'd say thank you and, and questions. Sarah, do you want me to stop sharing? Uh -huh. um, as you wish, either way, we can leave that, that slide up or um, it doesn't matter. Um, we'll just, we have plenty of questions. We have a wonderful chat going. Thank you so much, uh, Johnny and Felipe for the presentation. Um, there's been lots of great discussion with some people addressing some of the questions that have already appeared in the chat. Um, I can pick and choose some questions. We won't be able to get to everything, of course. Um, and then Felipe and Johnny, if you see any that you particularly want to address, um, feel free to raise those. Um, but to get us started with the questions, um, there was a question, who is responsible for ensuring the OECMs meet the criteria and is there an accountability mechanism for this? So who is responsible would be whichever group um, or agency I think it chooses to, to identify it. So if it's a fisheries department within a government, they'd be responsible for kind of identifying it, but it would be submitted, I believe, to the World Database on OECMs by that government. government. If it's a non um, government body, which is submitting it, uh, for example, an indigenous group, I believe that they uh, can submit to the world database, but there's a kind of back and forth screening process with experts for that. Um, ultimately, you know, a bit like marine protected areas, anything that is submitted by a government is state verified. So as soon as it's in the world database, it's there. Um, you know, it's 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 considered third party verified. So that is uh, my. Uh, perception of the answer there. If anyone's on from UNEP, uh, I'd love you to come in, or Felipe, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, just briefly to complement what you said, uh, Johnny, you're right, yes, and I have to uh, maybe make clear that there are two main main steps in for OECM. One is the identification, you know, and, you know, the, the, the site level tool is providing guidance for that. And the other step uh, is reporting, you know, so normally uh, parties of the CDB governments are in charge of the the the, the reporting part of it. So in, in that regard, it's very important the interinstitutional coordination between, you know, who's uh, running, you know, this authority, who's running the, 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 the screening tool and, and who's reporting. So uh, ideally they can have a, a, a common standard or guidance uh, to uh, both identify and then report OECMs. Thank you so much. Um, okay, I mean, so many good questions. Um, let's see, great talk. I was just wondering if there's an international community of practice that OECM practitioners could participate in. It may be useful for us to hear how other countries are addressing OECMs and issues they may be facing. 
I'm going to take this fully paid because I think you'd be more involved in the kind of um, workshop yes. and analysing process. Yes, what, what I can, uh, well, in my experience in, in Latin America uh, with WCPA, we're working uh, regionally uh, with um, Central America and the Caribbean and South America um, in a project to actually connect different stakeholders and um, people working on OECS in, in particular uh, to create a, um, a, a like a, a support for a different people working on OECS, both marine and terrestrial. And uh, we do have a web website where, well, which it, it is in Spanish because in Latin America, but there's some, um, you know, there's a, a community of practice for OECMs. And, and 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 I know that in other region of the world there are some uh, other experiences that are trying to do uh, this uh, same you know ideas. And, and also, as I said at the start, you know IUCN is is developing uh, in the process right now, developing an array of OECN kind of working groups. So these might specialize in you know Felipe and myself are coordinating the marine group, but there's groups for other um, habitats. There's a regional kind of um, split of groups, so focused on different parts of the world. There's also an NGO group. Um, so I think if you had expertise and wish to get involved in that, you could drop um, myself or Felipe a, an email and we can make sure that gets to the right place and our, our addresses are on the, on the screen there. Okay, thank you guys. Um, okay, another question. Have there been discussions at the international level around the possibility of dynamic measures designed to protect endangered migratory species, such as whales, considered for OECM recognition. Dynamic measures could be those in place seasonally or those that move as the species migrate. I don't believe so. And I think as per the criteria, uh, the kind of, you know, is it a geographically defined space and the long-term element might play into seasonal seasonal approaches and, and kind of dynamic perimeters of, of these areas. I think in there seasonally is something that comes up a bit in a fisheries context because again is it you know is that bringing uh, long term um, you know in, in situ conservation benefits if these things are kind of periodic and I think that's again one of these case by case basis subjective does it meet the criteria but I've not heard any discussion yet about these kind of dynamic uh oecms not you know not to say that that they couldn't exist but i haven't heard anything i mean i know in an mpa context we've spoken about quite a bit like can we shift the boundaries you know a species move due to um climate change for example and they've never really taken off uh, as of yet um again felipe do you have anything any view on that well i think um the what you answer is 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 is, 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 is correct. Thank you. Um, there's a question: Could passive ma management, including areas which have been designated for long periods of time as exclusion zones, for relate reasons related? Okay, could passive management include areas which have been designated for long periods of time as exclusion zones for re reasons related to marine transportation, for example? Yeah, so would these be kind of areas to be avoided within the IMO or, or something like that? And I think, I would assume there's, no, again, there's no reason that something like that couldn't count, but you would have to show that in that geographical space. So if you have a shipping exclusion zone and you're saying because of this, within this area, we are avoiding ship strikes of whales. So that brings, that could bring cascading ecosystem benefits. I think you'd have to show that there aren't other major threats in that geography. So, you know, is there oil and gas extraction? Is there, uh, what what level of fishing is taking place? You kind of have to think this, this kind of in situ conservation of biodiversity that you say your OECM is uh, conserving. Are there other threats, direct threats on that biodiversity and are they being managed would be the key questions there, I think. Thank you. Yes, oh, so just to complement that, uh, again, 
we do have definition of what it means these biodiversity values. I think if any area, you know, area geographically defined that is not a, an MPA, it could be considered if they meet this or have any of the six different biodiversity values. And you know, the example that Johnny mentioned in terms of fishing, you know, kind of have having um uh, you know biodiversity outcomes in terms of conserving whales, it could be of course something to to consider. Thank you, Felipe. Thank you, Johnny. Um another question that we got where OECM are identified based on expectations, for example, criteria six and seven, will there be a verification slash validation period after which the OECM identification is confirmed? That is when the expected potential effectiveness of conservation is realized. Felipe, do you wanna try it? Okay, I can go. I think that the, I, I believe that this is, I could be contradicted here, but I think that the this burden of proof, how do you show the conservation outcomes of your OECM? Uh, and I think that, you know, as per the areas of subjectivity that I spoke about, that you can, you know, if, if you've already got a measure in the water that's been in place for 10 years and it has this uh, benefit to biodiversity, you can actually show that now, right? You can say, hey, this, this fisheries measure has been in place for 10 years it is clearly bringing long-term biodiversity benefits, it should count. But if you kind of have a measure now where you've created it and you say, we're doing this and we think there will be ancillary conservation benefits. Um, and we, you know, we have a theory of change based on, uh, you know, parallel efforts elsewhere. So we are predicting biological benefits. Then, you know, it seems that that could be counted, but then you've got to really you know, how do you show those benefits over the long term? How do you show that they're being maintained? And this is a bit of a, I think, an area that's not quite been smoothed over yet, because, again, this is where people compare OECMs to, to MPAs. Like that burden of proof that they're working is greater for OECMs, we believe, than MPAs. But how do you actually demonstrate those long-term biodiversity benefits once your OECM has been recognized I think it's not entirely been bottomed out yet, but Felipe, do you have any view on that? I agree. I, I agree with you, Johnny. Yes, these two criteria, six and seven, definitely are very subjective. Uh, I mean, because they they are mentioning current um, benefits or expected potential future, you know, benefits or so. This uh, more like an intention into the future. So uh, there's uh, some room for subjectivity, but again, if you can uh, relate both the governance and the management with future expectation in terms of biodiversity values, uh, and the same for uh, avoiding threats, you can maybe with, with the same the same example of the, the, you know, any restriction for fishing, for uh, shipping, for some for navigation, it could be, you know, an expected future uh, positive conservation outcome or biodiversity value. So, uh, and again, here is, is case by case, you know, it's important that people know very well their sites and, and, and have the data. And that's very important, the evidence to see, to to, um, to have a foundation to uh, argue that any of these two criteria uh, could have a expected uh, result. Okay, thank you, Felipe. Thank you, Johnny. Um, we'll go to one more question. It's sort of a big one. Um, do OECMs undermine the establishment of MPAs? OEMs can be f configured to provide very minimal protection. Um, ideally, they complement MPAs and and help you broaden the network and the number of stakeholders who are contributing to uh, you know target three. But you know, I think there is there is also a risk. You know, I think from the work that I do, you've seen some geographies where, for example, uh, you know, fully protected MPA projects might have been discussed for a while by multiple stakeholders, uh, and there might be some opposition, for example, to to sort of other users of, of that area who might see their you know industry or livelihood at threat. 
And then an OECM comes along in another area where the proposal is basically to recognize something that's already happening. So, you know, you no longer need that fully protected area in order to meet your national targets of 30 by 30. And I think we are seeing examples where that's quite tempting uh, for policymakers. It can kind of be the path of least resistance, which negates the need to have a fully protected area. And therefore, you might say there's less biological benefit of the route um, that has been that has been traveled there. So I think uh, there could be examples of that. And it goes back to my kind of glass half full versus glass half empty slide um, you know, benefits uh, versus risks. But I think if done well, then, you know, overall, there will be clear benefits. Okay. Yes, on, on the same ahead, line, very, very briefly, uh, yes, uh, OCM should complement MPA systems. Uh, we know that, um, you know, the, the primary area-based management tool for conservation of biodiversity is our protected areas. So we, we don't have to, you know, you know now we, there's a very active um, agenda and discussion about OECM, but we don't have to forget about MPAs. We need to um, uh, continue to, you know, create MPAs and, and also um, we don't, we have to implement the existing MPAs in, in the ocean. And that means, you know, have to have, you know, an effective management uh, for, for all of them. Okay, thank you so much. We're gonna end there. Um, um, this was a fantastic discussion and I don't know if you you were able to follow that, uh, Johnny and Felipe, but people have asked for the chat transcript and uh, the recording um, as well as the slides. Um, it's been incredibly valuable to have you here today talking about all this and answering questions. And um, we'd love to have you back on sometime in the near future uh, um, as, as there are more, um, tools to share and more discussion to be had. So we'd love to have you on. We thank you so much for being here and we'd like to thank everyone who's here. Um, my email, uh, if you want any of the products or to be, um, you'll get an automated email, which will link you to um, the, uh, the webpage that will be on Octo's website with the recording. And, um, and I will also send the chat transcript out to everyone. If you have any additional questions, you can send it to me. I'll just put my email here. Um, but thank you everyone for being here, for caring, and for all your work. And thank you again, Johnny and Felipe, for, for presenting today. And hopefully we can we can meet again to talk more about OECMs. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.